Protecting safe, organic forest spaces promotes biodiversity and ecosystems enabling place-based learning, now and into the future. In 1972, actions were taken to bring organic forest spaces around Saskatoon. With proactive conservation and protection measures, the afforestation areas and wetlands can remain as a semi-wilderness habitat and provide physical and mental health benefits for current and future users to enjoy. This is the story of the wild woods of Saskatoon. Well, this afforestation area that we're standing in, which is named after Richard St. Barr Baker, was planted in 1972 under a forward-thinking plan developed by Parks Department in Saskatoon at that time. They thought that lands outside of the existing area of Saskatoon and the areas that would be needed for future subdivision could be developed into a green belt. So the idea of green belts comes to us from uh, England. Uh, it was uh, an idea that was uh, popular in the 1950s, and the idea was to, to build a hard perimeter around cities. And uh, so it could be, could be trees, could be uh, uh, green uh, grass, native shrubbery, even maybe agriculture, but it was going to be a green space outside the city. So one could say that the beginnings of this actually goes back to 1960. The 60s were a time of expansion in Saskatoon. And two city planners, Bert Wellman and Bill Graham, working for the city planning department, were involved in looking at where a Circle Drive Parkway envisioned at that time would go. Bill Graham is the guy that stood up at a meeting and said, this is where we're going to build Circle Drive, drew a line around the city. And this is, that's where we built Circle Drive. And so his idea, which came out in a, in a plan in 1960, was that we're going to take a 250-yard strip all around the outside of Circle Drive, and that was going to be Saskatoon's green belt. And Bert Wellman walked the perimeter of Saskatoon looking for sites of scenic beauty, and that came to fruition in 1972 when this afforestation plan was uh, approved and was implemented. They, they connected it with what was called the Green Survival Program. The Green Survival Program was started in 1970 by the American Nursery Men's Association and the Canadian Nursery Trades Association also adopted it. And of course, 1970 was a big turning point in the affairs of the interest in environmental issues. People here in Saskatoon that were developing this program had heard about this uh, green survival program and they adopted that as uh, part of the umbrella term for what this tree planting afforestation program would look like. So they ordered 200,000 trees in that first planting year from the PFRA Tree Nursery, or since called the PFRA Shelter Belt Centre, and planted 660 acres in total. This was the main site, and there was one site south of Leaf Breaker Park. And they used a tractor-drawn tree planter, mechanical tree planter, where two people sit on either side of a shear that opens up, uh, opens up a trench. They alternated what species they put in to the tree, to the trench. They also, the tree planter also went in kind of a weaving pattern, so it didn't look like a plantation. It looked more like a natural forest. And in fact, you can only discern that on air photos that it's done in a weaving pattern. And when you're on the ground, you can't really tell and see that it's all rows. Unfortunately, the program didn't continue as original plan envisioned. They envisioned planting uh, over 2,000 acres, it's somewhere near 2,500 acres. All we know is that the 660 acres were planted. Of that, we know that we have this area here, the Richard St. Barr Baker Air Force Station area and the George Jenner Urban Regional Park. Why does the immediate Saskatoon area, and especially around the A4 Station areas, look like they do today? I think the story begins probably about 70,000 years ago with the advance of the Wisconsin and Glacier. Initially, when glaciers melt, they create a lot of melt water, and the entire Saskatoon region was underneath something called Glacial Lake Saskatoon. Once that glacial lake drained through various spillways, 
then of course that water uh, is gone and we're left with uh, a post-glacial uh, lake environment. Once the, uh, the glacial lake uh, had receded, the deltas that were formed by these rivers, dumping their load at the mouth, uh, end up being large sand hills. Both of the afforestation areas are up on the uplands. They're now down on the floodplain. They're not near the river channel. So they are higher up. St. Barb Baker has a lot of uh, unusual trees. Um, so it is, it is a real gem. It's a magical place, needs preservation. St. Barb Baker Reserve is, was once part of the Old Bone Trail and that ran from Saskatoon in a uh, southwesterly direction towards Rosetown. And it's the trail that homesteaders used in the early 20th century. Uh, in the early 1900s, uh, Saskatchewan was advertised as the last best west. When the settlers come and travel along that old bone trail, the bison are gone, you've got the remnants of these great herds, and it's, it's kind of an exclamation point finding these bones along the trail about one of the great tragedies in terms of what happened to the bison herds, how this once great animal that numbered in the millions is now gone, reduced the bones that are being sold to American companies to make fertilizer. One of the great myths of Western Canadian history is that the bison were wiped out by white hunters shooting from trains. And there's a problem with that story. The CPR didn't build westward across Winnipeg until 1881-1882. And yet the bison were gone effectively from this region by 1879. So there's a disconnect between the building, the railway, and when the bison disappeared. And what's essentially happened is that they've taken an American story, shooting by white hunters from trains, and transferred it north and applied it to the Canadian situation. It doesn't fit here. What actually happened in the early 20th century, the major economic activity in this region dominated by white traders was the fur trade. And you had fur trade posts across the Northwest, including present-day Saskatchewan. And these fur trade posts were populated by people that ran the post and uh, made sure operations uh, proceeded smoothly. They didn't have time to hunt. And so they depended on pemmican. Pemmican was dried, pounded bison meat, mixed with grease, sometimes added uh, with the berries, and it was a kind of superfood because it packed a caloric punch, great energy, and it could last for years. First Nations leaders talked about the bison and the need to preserve them. And the Canadian government, to its credit, does do something in March of 1877. They introduce an ordinance called the Bison Protection Ordinance in March of 1877. The problem with those regulations is that they more or less came too late. By 1879, the once great bison herds are gone from the Northern Plains, gone from the Saskatoon area, gone from the Old Bone Trail area, gone from the St. Barb Baker Reserve area. So it is special that this reserve has been set aside and preserved in a, in a natural state when all the land around them has not only been settled broken, but you've got the use of herbicides and pesticides. You've got a different environment than what existed a century ago. And so that's what makes this uh, reserve so special. At a meeting in October of 1978 of the Parks Board, uh, the idea of naming this area after Richard St. Barr Baker, the naming of the other afforestation area that is Kitty Corner here uh, across Highway 7, the George Jenneru Urban Regional Park and the naming of Chief Whitecap Park were all approved at that same meeting. And that was forwarded to City Council and was given formal approval on January 2nd, 1979. At the 1952 Summer Olympic Games, George Jenneru took home Canada's only gold medal at age 17 and was Canada's youngest Olympic champion, a record held until 2016. He was later inducted into multiple sports halls of fame and became a professor and radiologist later in life. Despite a crippling case of ankylosing spondylitis, Genero worked to advance the cause of medical knowledge, saying, if you can't help yourself, you should use your God-given talents to help others. 
Richard St. Barb Baker, who I call St. Barb as his friends did. He had grown up on a farm uh, that is, his father had a tree nursery and uh, in the large wooded area nearby, St. Barb had ventured into these woods at an age of five and had a sense of the numinous of the spirit in nature and felt this deep connection to uh, nature at that time and developed it, this sense of deep vision, I guess, about the importance of trees and forests uh, to the global environment and the importance of reconnecting humanity with nature. The organization that he'd started called Children of the Green Earth. The motto was, from our hearts, with our hands, for the earth, all the world together. He developed the Men of the Trees as an organization and it eventually grew in the late 40s to be engaged in over 100 countries. It of course has changed its name to the International Tree Foundation, more in touch with the, the times of today. You can see that he really had a passion for trees and he really uh, knew how to engage people in a very practical way. And he had this vision of the earth made green through the planting of trees. So the Fat Tire Brigade is the only um, known fat bike specific mountain bike club that we're aware of in, in Canada. And so there's 18 kilometers of trails that are, that are out here now and established and have been for four or five years. One thing that's really been a success is trying to get people excited and embracing winter. And so that, um, for me at least, was very important. I'm a, a winter lover and this is a fantastic space. Uh, we're so fortunate to have it, uh, to be able to come out and, uh, and enjoy it. The community has been growing. Uh, we see it in recreation all over, whether it's hikers or bikers, dog walkers, hoping to culture that these different communities can come together and interact and, and really have respect for each other and, and a shared enjoyment of the, of the space. Be Like Bruce uh, it came from, uh, it was really in, in homage to our, our late friend, uh, Bruce Gordon, who was, um, he was an incredible athlete, but he was also a family man. Uh, he was a Saskatoon police officer for many years, retired from the police service only to take up a, a law career uh, in his adult life. And so I would always watch Bruce walk around and introduce himself to new people and in, invite them to come out for training events or you know social events just to be, be part of the group and the community. And, and so I would often tell myself when I was the you know, veteran of a group and, and there was a new person to be like Bruce and go and introduce myself to that person and include them. And so that's where Be Like Bruce uh, came from and, and has really been an anthem for the sort of uh, work we've done in his memory to raise money for pancreatic cancer research and, and also continue to build inclusive communities. Really we're uh, trying to champion and lobby to see this recognized as a formal park, which I don't think has happened yet. So I think all of us would like to see that that designation, see the space used for where the community can come and enjoy it. And you know, I think of many cities that would would turn themselves inside out to have a space like this right on the edge of the city. Uh, so just yeah, trying to to keep the space as as pristine as we can and and letting people enjoy it. Benjamin Thomas Chapel, Saskatchewan CNR superintendent, was a city builder who supported the fledging pioneer days of the Saskatoon Exhibition, which now attracts 1.6 million people. The Friends of Saskatoon Afforestation Areas invite you to be a Saskatoon city builder committed to the conservation and protection of the Chapel Marsh wetlands, forests and grasslands. Green infrastructures, which, if protected, provide a wide array of benefits to people and wildlife. The areas are excellent places to study regeneration, ecological succession, geology, and First Nations history. The West Swale wetlands are a remnant of the Yorath Island Spillway, and this influenced its flora and fauna and Paleo-Indian activity. In these forests, the past meets the present and future. The rich geological, historical, natural, and cultural heritage of the areas honors where we have been. Science, conservation, and hands-on learning about the land, the environment, and sustainability ensure our future. We therefore honor those who were here before us who called this place home, and protect these places for those who come after us.
Richard, St. Bar Baker and Forestation Area and George Jenner Urban Regional Park location. The Legacy of Saskatoon's Secret Forest, now on YouTube.